February community conversation with District 92. Uh, my name is Terry Brown. I represent uh, North Carolina House District 92, which is Southwest Mecklenburg County, going all the way from uh, West Moorhead Street, West Boulevard, the airport, and all of Steel Creek. Uh, we've got a great conversation we want to have this morning um, as we begin to go into the long session here in the General Assembly. Uh, we've got some fantastic guests. We'll be providing us with some updates on what's going on in the General Assembly and what's going on in North Carolina. And I'll talk to you all about some legislation that is already uh, passed this week and some legislation that's gonna be forthcoming that I've had the opportunity to sponsor and hear from you all. Uh, one of the most important things I wanna make sure that we're doing is staying in constant contact with the district, hearing about what you guys wanna see from a policy standpoint, what you all would like to see from a COVID relief standpoint and a budgetary standpoint as we get ready to go into negotiations on our state's uh, biennial budget. So all those things are gonna be conversations that I wanna make sure that we're doing throughout the year um, and throughout this long session. So thank you all for listening in, uh, for tuning in on Zoom. For those of you on Facebook, if you ever have any questions, please leave them in the chat box. And we have some, we're monitoring the chat box. So we'll make sure uh, that we can answer any questions that come in uh, via Facebook. And if you have any questions throughout this presentation while you're watching on Zoom, uh, please make sure that you use the raise your hand feature or the Q&A. And we will uh, make sure we can answer those as well. So with that being said, Thank you for taking time out on your Saturday morning to come and join us. And we will now turn it over to some of our presenters today. Uh, we're gonna be hearing from North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, as well as North Carolina DOT to provide us with some uh, much needed updates. I think the top two questions that I've been getting asked about uh, since I got sworn in in January are about COVID, the vaccines, and then also about existing uh, infrastructure projects and roads here in District 92. So I uh, wanted to bring in some people who are able to speak directly to those issues and answer a lot of those questions. So I will now be turning it over to the Deputy Director of Government Affairs for North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, uh, Ms. Hattie Gwande, who will be able to provide us with some great updates on COVID, the vaccine, and answer a lot of those questions. So uh, Hattie, I will turn it now over to you. Thank you so much, Representative Brown. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm sorry, I think that my video is disabled on the Zoom, but um, I am so glad to sort of virtually see your participation. Um, and so I'll just go through some quick pandemic updates, but then I'm gonna share a slide deck and go through a more in-depth update on vaccines. And so my goal is to kind of... Oops, sorry, I just got muted. Um, my goal is to kind of give you a quick sort of vaccine 101 and then demystify some of the details of vaccine distribution um, in the state. So quickly on the pandemic update side, um, as you all likely know, we remain under a modified stay at home order, which includes um, a 10 p.m. Uh, stay at home order from uh, uh, basically a curfew. Um, and we in continue to phase operate in basically a modified phase three where people can continue to eat at restaurants, outdoors, and um, in places where they can socially distance, but they have to be taking essential pre prevention steps, including wearing a mask at all times when you are not in your home. So at the same time, we are seeing a decline in cases and hospitalizations across the state, but case rates and hospitalizations in general remain high and much higher than we would like them to be. And Mecklenburg in particular is still in what we're calling the red tier. So we categorize counties on a tier by tier basis. If you're in the yellow, you're looking relatively um, uh, you still have a high rate of cases, but looking relatively okay. In the orange, a little bit more critical. And then in the red is really substantial community spread of COVID-19. And Mecklenburg is one of those red tier states, uh, sorry, red tier counties. And so we remain really concerned about that. Um, two weeks ago, there were 86 counties in the red. Now there are only 61 counties in the red. So we're seeing some improvement, but I know things are, are, are diff still difficult in the Mecklenburg area. So with all that said, I really wanted to spend the bulk of this time talking about vaccines. And before I share this deck, I thought I would just say that um, 
there are about, we are now at about 1.3 million doses administered statewide. And you've probably seen in just the past few weeks that number has really taken off. So all of our awesome local vaccine providers have ramped up their, um, have ramped up their uh, operations and um, are now really administering doses at a fast clip. At the same time, supply remains very limited in the state. We only get, um, about 120,000 to 140,000 vaccines each week, which is why a lot of people who are currently eligible for the vaccine are still having to wait to get an appointment. Mecklenburg represents about 90,000 of those doses administered um, with the demographics definitely still looking like about 72.5% of those um, racially are white and only about 16.5% are black, 4.11% Hispanic, 4.7% Asian and less than a percent are American Indian. So I'll dive a little bit into how at the, from the state perspective, we're, we wanna improve those numbers. And I've definitely heard from your local health director about a lot of interesting initiatives happening locally. So I will share my screen real quick, try and speed through this deck because um, I know that you all already know a lot about the vaccine and kind of just wanna cover some basics. So um, just skip real quick. So. Um, again, like I said, this is going to be a little bit of a vaccine 101, but then I really want to get into more operational details to, de to de demystify a little bit of the um, distribution. So before I jump in, I always try and start these presentations by acknowledging that equity remains a, a serious consideration in the distribution of the vaccine. Racism runs through all of our systems, but in particular, it, causes, it has caused um, unequal access to healthcare. And these longstanding and continuing racial and ethnic injustices contribute to a understandable lack of trust in vaccines and a lack of access to vaccines. So when we started building our distribution plan, we not only wanted to acknowledge that that's the case, but we wanted to try and um, try and counterbalance some of those forces. And that really meant um, that leaders from historically marginalized communities not only needed to be advising the plan, but needed to be at the table helping us make decisions, which is um, hopefully you'll see that running through our strategy later on in the presentation. Mm -hmm. So these are the kind of the five key messages that we want everyone to be sharing with their communities about the vaccine. It's likely that it's going to be quite a while until the average member, until you know the general member of the public can access the vaccine, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be working hard in the meantime to educate everyone about the vaccine so that they can make an informed decision when their, when their spot comes in line. So the top line here is that tested, safe, and effective COVID-19 vaccines will help us get back in control of our lives and back to the people and places that we love. Um, and I'm going to go through each of these kind of sub points in turn. So the first is that scientists had a head start. I think you all, many of you have heard that the vaccines are relying on a new kind of technology. Um, so uh, Previously, a lot of vaccines had live virus in them. This is not one of those. Um, and I'll dive a little bit into how the vaccine works in a few slides. Um, but the bottom line here is that even though this is the first time we have seen this technology in a federally approved vaccine, it's built on, uh, on years of work to develop vaccines for similar viruses. And the technology has been studied and has existed for decades. In fact, in that picture there, Dr. Kazmikia Corbett is a North Carolina uh, born uh, viral immunologist who actually worked on the technology that underpins the vaccine. The vaccines are tested safe and effective. And in fact, more than 70,000 people volunteered in clinical trials for the two vaccines, which are, you probably heard the words Pfizer and Moderna, um, to make sure that they're safe and work to prevent COVID. Of those 70,000 people uh, along uh, during the trials, the vaccines were shown to be 95% effective, which is far, far better than we expected. As many of you know, the flu vaccine by comparison, less than 50% are uh, end up being vaccinated against um, strains of, of the flu, whereas this vaccine is obviously quite a bit more effective. So there were no serious safety concerns in any of those clinical trials. Um, at the same time, we want you to know that when you get vaccinated, you will feel temporary reactions like a sore arm, a headache, feeling tired or achy for a day or two. 
Um, quick personal story, my 83 year old grandmother and uh, my dad who don't live in North Carolina, but they volunteered for the Moderna trials and they both think that they got the vaccine because they both had low grade fevers for about 24 hours, but um, they are both doctors and they told me that's really the best sign you have that the vaccine is working um, because that is your immune system gearing up to fight the virus if it actually were to come and attack you, which is why you might feel a little under the weather for a day or two while your, your immune system is getting stronger. There have been intentional efforts among the vaccine manufacturers to recruit volunteers for their trials from historically marginalized populations. And this is something that drug manufacturers, vaccine manufacturers have struggled with in the past. Many of you likely know that a lot of the vaccines and medications that we take every day are tested on a very, on a not very diverse a cohort of clinical volunteers. Um, in this case, Pfizer and Moderna made intentional efforts to recruit a diverse pool of clinical volunteers. You can see the breakdown there between Pfizer and Moderna. Um, so we can say with a little bit more confidence this time that um, this vaccine is effective across demographics. So this is really key because I still think that this is um, a myth that's, that is persisting um, in, uh, among some people, which is, um, some people think you can get COVID from the vaccine. That is not the case. You cannot get COVID-19 from the vaccine because there is no live virus in the vaccine. Instead, what the vaccine does is pretty cool. So it imitates COVID, which basically teaches your body to make a protein um, that then teaches your body to make an antibody to fight the real COVID-19. Um, then after getting vaccinated, your immune system is able to fight off the real virus if it tries to attack you. So like I said, no live, no live virus, the vaccines instead imitate COVID to teach your body what it needs to know to make those antibodies. Two shots are necessary. Um, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines require you to get two shots to um, develop full immunity against COVID-19. The second shot for Pfizer comes three weeks after the first, for Moderna it comes four weeks after the first, and you have to get the same vaccine both times. So that is if you get Pfizer the first time, you need to get Pfizer the second time. Moderna the first time, you need to get Moderna the second time. That's not for you to worry about though, all of the vaccine, um, uh, uh, providers know what you need to get on your second dose. So we built a system, which is called the COVID-19 vaccine management system, to help make sure that you not only get the right vaccine, the right dose, um, the second time, but also at the right time. And then I'm going to speed through these. You might recognize some of the faces on these slides showing who has gotten vaccinated already. And I'll just say your privacy and personal information are protected at all times. I hear a lot of concerns about there being trackers in the vaccine and that people's data is being shared with the federal government. That is not true. Nothing in the vaccine can be tracked. The protein that I mentioned that your body makes, it gets broken down and flushed out of your body, just like every other protein that makes its way through your body. Um, and we don't share any of your personal information with the federal government or with the CDC. Um, I'm going to pause here for a second to talk a little bit about supply because I think that this is the main thing that people are hearing about vaccine distribution right now and just want to really double down on the message that our goal is to vaccinate as many people as quickly and fairly as possible given the limited supply of vaccines, but we are limited by that supply of vaccines. So like I said, only about 120,000 to 140,000 doses of vaccine come into the state every week. And you all know in a, in a state of 10 million, you know, that's a fraction of the vaccinatable population. So that means that we have a prioritization scheme that, me, that makes sure that those at the highest risk of exposure um, to the virus and the highest risk of getting severe illness from the virus can get it first. Oh. Um, oh. Okay, this is what I wanted to show you. So this is this is that prioritization scheme. So right now, healthcare workers and long-term care staff and residents, as well as adults 65 plus, can get a vaccine. So they can call up their uh, local vaccine provider and try and make an appointment. Um, and the next group will be frontline essential workers. So those are people who have to work within six feet of others, um, uh, on site at a work site, and are in certain essential industries like. Um, food and agriculture or um, government essential services, government and community services, or um, essential manufacturing. There's a list of eight, but we're not there yet. 
And then after that will be the rest of essential workers who are not necessarily frontline, as well as adults with certain chronic medical conditions. And then last will be everyone. So who is being vaccinated now? I mentioned the healthcare workers, long-term care staff and residents and older adults. Um, with the exception of long-term care staff and residents who are getting vaccinated through a federal partnership with CVS and Walgreens, most people right now are getting their vaccines through a vaccine provider. And um, those are available. You can find a list of them on our website, but we also have set up a hotline, 1-888-675-4567 to help you navigate um, your way to your vaccine if you are eligible. Quickly going to just pause here again for a minute. This is, you know, we include this because I think that there are a lot of people who have questions about how the vaccine gets here. And I personally get a lot of questions about whether we can kind of stop the vaccine in transit or redirect it or decide to change it from going to one community to another, um, which we can't do. So what happens is every week on about Tuesday or Wednesday, the federal government lets us know how much vaccine we are going to get as a state the following week. So we take, it's just a number. We take that number and then we determine which providers will get how many doses based on reaching those um, prioritized populations that you saw on the chart. So right now that's primarily local health departments, hospital systems, and um, some community providers like federally qualified health centers. And then we just put in an order with the manufacturer and they ship the vaccines directly to the local providers. So they never pass through our hands. They never pass through the hands of the state, like I mentioned. Um, providers safely store and handle the vaccines and then vaccinate North Carolinians in groups. So I kind of went through this, so I'm gonna skip this. Um, so these are just the main tools that we want you to be taking advantage of as you're um, thinking about getting your shot when your eligibility group comes up. The first is our website, yourspotyourshot.nc.gov has everything I just described. It actually just it has this slide deck, um, it has FAQ, it has um, all the latest information uh, about what you need to know about the vaccine. We also have, for those who are not as comfortable navigating the internet or perhaps struggle to access the internet, we have a help center, which is available at that number that I mentioned, 888-675-4567. And then we have two tools. Here's a picture on the next slide. One will help you find your vaccine group. So if you go to vac find my vaccine group, it's linked on that website too that I mentioned. Um, you can just answer some simple gating questions. How old are you? What do you do for a living? And it will tell you what group you're in. And then if you're eligible, you can go to find my spot and type in your zip code and find a local vaccine provider near you. This slide just kind of reinforces that leading medical and professional organizations um, believe the vaccine is not only safe, but essential to get us back to our regular lives. And then um, I will just stop here. This is kind of a list. Uh, this is just a quick um, screenshot of all of the things that are available on our website. So like I said, not only this deck, FAQ, a one-page flyer, that infographic I mentioned, but also PSA videos from trusted messengers that I hope that you'll share with your community. So I'm going to stop sharing and I will stop here. Perfect. Um, thank you. That was some really helpful information. And we had a few questions that came up uh, on the Zoom and on Facebook. And uh, I wanted to start out with the first one that came in on Facebook. And it was, uh, can you choose which vaccine that you take? Ooh, this is a good question. I got this one the other day for the first time. Um, so <laughs> the first thing I'll say is, one, um, that the vaccines from a consumer standpoint are not all that different. So they both require two shots. They both are 95% effective. Um, and they both, you know, lead to those side effects of feeling tired a little bit right afterwards. Um, the main difference between the two of them is from the distributor perspective. So one of them requires ultra cold storage, which makes it a little bit harder to store and distribute, whereas one, Moderna, does not require that. But otherwise, from the perspective of you and me, they're pretty interchangeable. With that said, if you have a strong um, preference for one of them, um, it, there are a couple of ways you could try to decide where to get your vaccine. So most providers only have one or the other. So 
we'll be shipping Pfizer to one because it comes in these big packs of 975. Whereas for more community providers, we'll be shipping Moderna because they only come in packs of 100. So you could try and pick a smaller provider like a federally qualified health center or a small local health department um, if you want to go to a neighboring community and you'll be able to get Moderna over Pfizer. But you can't go to say your local health department and say, I want this vaccine instead of this vaccine. They're stuck with what they've got um, on hand. Okay. Fantastic. That's good. Um, another question we have in the chat box over here uh, is what documents do you have to provide to uh, prove which group you're part of? Great question. And this is very important. You are not required to show ID or to provide any kind of employment documents of any kind in order to get vaccinated. Some providers are asking for ID just so, you know, if you're if they're hooked up to an electronic health record or something like that, but you're not required to show those things. So you instead you'll be self attesting to your eligibility for the categories. Um, and we think that's really important to make sure that there is access, especially among people who might not have documents or among people whose employers aren't necessarily um, providing them with the documentation they need, we still think that they need to be able to get vaccinated. So self-attestation only right now. Okay, and that's, um, another question that we've got in the box, uh, has, has uh, this improved since the change in administration? Mm, good question. So I think the main bottleneck to mass distribution is has little to do with the administration and it's really to do with limited supply from the manufacturers and that's not the manufacturer's fault right they're they are shipping to dozens of dozens of countries um we are in the unique position in the united states to have manufacturing plants here in our country so we have a little bit less supply chain issues um on the pfizer side but um as long as supply remains limited um, we're going to continue to see slow distribution and, and those kinds of bottlenecks. At the same time, um, we've seen a couple of shifts that we appreciate from the federal administration. Um, while I think it's it's uh, early in the new administration for them to really have their operations ramped up, um, one thing that we really appreciate is they have moved away from saying that they're going to do punitive allocations. And what that means is under the previous administration, they said, if you get shots and if you if you still have shots sitting on the shelves at the end of the week, so if we allocate you 120,000 doses and you still have 20,000 doses sitting on the shelf, um, we're going to dock your allocation next week. This administration has backed away from doing that so far. And the reason why is because there are a lot of legitimate reasons why providers might be going more slowly. For example, doing smaller events, getting out into the community might might prioritize equity. So at, at the state level, um, we're doing great in North Carolina, getting 100% of shots into arms every single week at this point. But um, it takes it takes some of that pressure off and, and lets you lets you slow down and, and decide to make decisions on the basis of equity in addition to speed. So that's been the main change that I've seen so far um, with the new administration. Okay, great. And what has been the? I know you touched on it briefly in your presentation, but what kind of is the process for determining we're going to send? You know, you get our allocation for the state. We're going to send X number to Mecklenburg. We're going to send X number to Gaston County. We're going to send X number to this county. What kind of is the, is there a, is a formula for that? Or how do you yeah. all determine that? Yeah. That's a, that's a super great question. Um, and unsurprising, you know, as you can imagine, um, <clears throat> I've been going through uh, versions of this conversation with every county in the state um, because they understandably want to know, hey, how do I get more vaccine? Is there something I need to be doing? I um, mean, so the answer is we we are we are we have a, a formula that we started implementing two weeks ago. So for the first few weeks of vaccine distribution, we allocated everything on a purely by population basis. So if you take a county, you know, it's getting if it's relatively bigger than its neighboring county, it will get more. If it's relatively smaller, it will get less. And it was just a strict population based formula. And that kind of reflected the fact that we felt that it was really important to make sure that there is access to the vaccine in every corner of the state. Then, like I said, there was that threat from the federal government that we were going to get our vaccine taken away unless we sped up. And so we started to get a little bit more to providers who could vaccine a large amount of vaccine, uh, so who could vaccinate a large amount of people very quickly. And so in Mecklenburg, you saw two huge events, one at the Charlotte Motor Speedway and one at Panther Stadium. Now that we've now that the federal government has kind of taken the foot off the gas a little bit, um, that's given us the ability to pivot to a different allocation formula. And it goes like this. 
90, so we get about 120,000 to 140,000 um, doses every week. 90,000 of those, so the majority, are allocated by population to all 100 counties. And again, that reflects our commitment to getting vaccine in all four corners of the state. But we recognize that there are populations in North Carolina that have disproportionately not been getting vaccinated. In particular, our marginalized communities, Black, Hispanic, American Indian, and low-income adults, 65 and older. So uh, counties with um, high concentrated poverty among 65 and older, or with concentrated populations of marginalized populations, 65 and older, then get a bump, um, we call it an equity um, set aside, uh, in their vaccine doses. And then last, we reserve about 25,000 doses every week to award to community vaccination events. So if a community provider gets together with their hospital and gets together with the local health department and says, I'm going to do a vaccine event at my church, or I'm going to do a vaccine event um, at uh, you know, a federally qualified health center, if they can show us that they're operationally ready, that they are um, taking steps to get the doses into arms in historically marginalized communities and that they are partnering with others, we'll get them the doses to do that. So that's the basic formula, it's three part formula. Okay, that's, 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 that's helpful to kind of think about how that kind of gets allocated. Um, we got another question in the Facebook feed and something that I kind of had thought about as well, um, discussing mobile vaccine programs. And I know I spoke with somebody from Atrium earlier this month and with the, I guess with the Pfizer vaccine, because it has to be in that kind of hyper cold, you can't really take it anywhere, but are there any plans to take the vaccine out into the community and to do, you know, to go mobile for people who don't have access to reliable transportation to help make sure they can get access to the vaccine if they want it? Yeah, this is a great question and is the subject of a lot of discussion nationwide because I think we all want to do mobile vaccination because it is such an equitable way um, to reach uh, populations that can't necessarily show up um, at a vaccine center or don't feel like showing up at a vaccine center um, at, or a provider. Um, so there's a couple of things. So both vaccines are difficult to transport because once you once they um, get taken out of their kind of storage pack, again, Moderna comes in packs of 100. It doesn't require ultra cold storage, but it does require cold storage. Um, so once they get taken out of that pack, you've got to use it in six hours. And you can't bring it down to room temperature and then freeze it again, and then bring it down to room temperature and freeze it again. You, it's kind of like one or done. So there's a possibility for wastage when you, when you do that. And so you need to be really careful about the units, the mobile units that you're using to transport it. But that doesn't make it impossible. It just makes it, it makes it difficult. Um, the second thing too is not a lot of um, providers with mobile units are onboarded yet. So like I said, only a small number of providers are onboarded. It's primarily local health departments, hospitals, and um, some federally qualified health centers. Whereas, for example, we're thinking about how we vaccinate the homebound. Home health is only just beginning to get onboarded um, because we have a limited supply of vaccine. So every new provider we bring on board and give vaccine, we have to take away from another provider. And that is a very, you know, that's a very tough decision to make um, when all our vaccine providers are doing a good job. So the short answer is um, we're working with a few smaller communities to kind of puzzle out how they can do um, vaccine, mobile vaccine administration. Yadkin County, for example, is doing it on its own. They have a kind of an interesting way of using paramedics to do it. But again, it's very small amounts. They're doing like less than a dozen a week um, in those in those home health kind of mobile vaccinations. So we're, we're headed in that direction. And there's some sort of things on the back end with the storage and the administration that we're still trying to figure out to make that maximally successful. Yeah, I think that's really kind of important to kind of think how we can, and I know it's difficult because of the how cold it is and the, the shelf life of it. So trying to figure out how to get that. But I think it's important to make sure that we can figure out some way to get it out to people where they are. I know that's what, you know, what we did with testing across the state and here locally, but um, yeah, think about those options. And you actually just reminded me of one thing, and I'm glad DOT is on here in case they want to provide color later in their presentation. But the other thing that we're trying to do in the meantime, since mobile vaccination is so hard and we're still figuring out those details, is making sure that people can get free transportation to a vaccine site. So there's about $2.5 million that we have that we um, that DOT is helpfully um, 
uh, allocating to local transit agencies to provide free rides to vaccines. So um, people can do that through their local transit agencies. And I know that in certain communities, Uber and Lyft are providing free rides. And we're trying to scale up both of those things um, at the same time as we're trying to bring mobile vaccination online. Okay, um, perfect. There's a couple, we got a couple more questions in, in uh, the, the Zoom box. So uh, a lot, we have two that are related to, um, I guess the priority of vaccinations, what the order is. Um, and one is, you know, I've had a lot of people actually call our offices this week um, in regards to teachers um, and just saying, is there, any, uh, is there any chance to move teachers to get vaccinated? Um, so that's a question I actually, our office has gotten a lot of emails about. Yeah. And there's also a question regarding, um, is there a rough estimate that you could provide of when uh, the state anticipates that the everyone group will uh, be able to receive their vaccinations? Two great questions. So let's pause on the first one for a second, because I definitely think that's one that's worth diving into a little bit. So um, first thing to note is that teachers are in the next group to get vaccinated. So teachers are considered frontline essential workers. And so that's group three. That's that next group that you saw on the prioritization scheme. So they are next. Um, at the same time, some of you may have seen that the governor, um, Secretary Cohen, the superintendent of public instruction and the chair of the State Board of Education um, released a letter earlier this week encouraging all school districts to go back to some form of in-person learning, be it um, fully in-person or hybrid, as long as they can implement um, essential prevention measures, things like six feet social distancing, um, masking at all times, uh, the proper environmental cleaning and things like that. The reason why that is, is because there's a lot of evidence at this point, including a ton of research done in North Carolina, that schools that do those proper prevention measures are not a, a major source of secondary transmission of the virus. That's not to say that teachers aren't on the front lines. They absolutely are, but they're in an environment that um, has done a really great job minimizing the risk of being, of being on the front lines. So, all that to say, I think it's really important that teachers are in the next group to get vaccinated along with all the other frontline essential workers. But I would be wary of um, if when we do move to group three, preventing food, you know, food processing workers, um, police and fire, um, social workers, other people who are on the front lines and are at, in some cases, an even higher risk from getting their vaccine at the same time. So, like I said, I think it's really important that teachers get vaccinated next alongside other frontline essential workers. But in the meantime, it really looks like those prevention measures that school districts are implementing well are doing a good job keeping people safe. Yeah. And I think from you know the briefings that I've seen, you you know more than I do about it. That it seems like the issue really is just the amount of vaccines that we get allocated. It's just this a supply issue at this point, right? Is that am I right thinking that? That's exactly right. So some of you may know that it's we've been in um, group two for weeks, and we've only vaccinated probably somewhere between a third and half of our adults of our older adults, sixty five plus, right? So that supply just really limits our ability to get immunity in a given population quickly. Um, so in the meantime, and I should have said this in the beginning of my presentation, it's even more important now that people are wearing their masks and taking those prevention measures because we don't want people to let down their guard because they think they're gonna get vaccinated next week. Right. Um, we've got another question on Facebook regarding um, any strategies or mandates to have providers set or provide vaccination centers and opportunity zones slash minority communities. Yeah, so you guys might have noticed that, well, I'll say a couple of things. One is our allocation strategy, so the amount of vaccine that each community gets is explicitly conditioned on whether they have census tracts where there's concentrated poverty or um, high population of minority communities. So I'm not sure if it maps well to the opportunity zones. I think the opportunity zones are probably a little bit too rigid. For us, it's just, if you have a census tract with concentrated poverty or concentrated marginalized communities, you'll get a little bit of extra vaccine. But then I know that that's just the allocation. We need to make sure it ends up in the arms of our minority communities and low-income communities. And we're doing that in a few ways. And I think that there's still quite a lot of progress to be made there. You heard at the top of my presentation that in Mecklenburg, 72.5% of doses are going to white populations. Um, and we want that to, to, to track population. So I don't actually know what the breakdown is in, in Mecklenburg, but um, 
the way that we're doing that is number one is we require all, as of a couple of weeks ago, we require all providers to attest to the, the fact that they are going to be vaccinating communities proportionate to population. So racial and ethnic communities proportionate to their representation in the county um, in order to receive their doses. We don't expect that to happen overnight, but we have given them some strategies to make that happen in the coming weeks. One is, we want people to be either locating their vaccination events in, in hard to reach communities, providing transportation from hard to reach communities to their vaccination events, or setting aside and or setting aside doses for members of historically marginalized communities to get vaccinated. So Guilford County Public Health, for example, sets aside 35% of their doses for historically marginalized populations. We also want people to be involving community health workers and community groups more in their vaccine operations. So again, that guidance that we put out to providers says, hey, set aside some doses for a community health worker to go out to their patient population. Community health workers deal with a lot of uninsured folks. They deal with a lot of people from marginalized communities and go fill them with your patient population. So you community health worker over here, you have 20 slots, fill them. Um, or to partner with a, with a church and say, hey, um, you know your church, you know who's open to be vaccinated, fill your slots with people from these, um, from, from your congregation. And then the last is those special events that I mentioned for setting aside 25,000 doses or special events in communities, specifically supposed to be located close by to communities that otherwise wouldn't really have access to the vaccine. One of the, one of the scoring mechanisms that we're using to decide who will get those doses is, um, do you have a really built out plant equity plan. So are you setting aside those doses? Are you providing free transportation? Are you having your event outside of bank hours or on the weekends? Things like that. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, we're going to take two more questions that we've got in there, and then we'll let you get back to your Saturday. And, and <laughs> uh, we appreciate the time. Uh, first question, um, and we kind of touched on a little bit, but you is uh, in the chat box. And do you know they'll be seeking vaccine setups at schools? Oh, good question. And I also, you mentioned the chat box and I remembered that there's one I didn't answer a minute ago. So I'll cover that in a second. Um, so we are um, allowing counties to kind of, we're saying they can operationally prioritize certain populations. Of course, many of them are asking about teachers. And what that means is if a provider wants to have an event located at a school or if they wanna set aside slots for teachers, that's totally fine. And I think that you'll probably see providers doing that in the Mecklenburg area. What we're wary of is um, say all the providers in Mecklenburg County saying, yeah, for the next two weeks, it's gonna be only teachers and only teacher events. We, again, we want our food processing plant work Workers and our social workers and our police and fire to get vaccinated too. So I think the answer is yes. Um, supply, as, as Representative Brown keeps saying, supply is the constraint. So it's, it's not going to be a bunch of them on day one. Um, but uh, the short answer is yes. And then I think um, somebody asked, when are we anticipating reaching the everyone group? And I, I wasn't dodging the question. I just forgot about it. Um, so I, a question I have as well, because I'm in that last group. I'm group five. Um, and um, I think as long as we don't know much about the supply chain, so as long as we, we know that we're getting 120,000 to 140,000 every week, we expect that will kind of bump up at some point, but we don't know when. And as long as that remains true, it's really hard for me to read my crystal ball and say, here's when we're going get to get to the last group. It's not going to be anytime soon. I can say that with a lot of certainty. I think we hope it'll be this year. And um, one positive sign is some of you might have seen that Johnson & Johnson, um, which is another vaccine manufacturer, is um, sort of going through the process to get federal approval now. And if you all remember months ago when we started hearing those whispers about Moderna and Pfizer, about a month later, a few weeks later, we got federal approval and it immediately started shipping to the states. So that's, I think, a sign that probably sometime in March, we'll get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that will bump up our supply quite a bit. Um, and the best thing about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is that unlike Pfizer and Moderna, it's a one-shot vaccine. So you just have to show up once. It might help to Representative Brown's point that that home health, the kind of mobile vaccination, because then you only have to show up at someone's house once. The data is easier. Um, the access is easier. You don't have to worry about somebody slipping through the cracks. So I can't give you a date, but I can tell you, I think things will get better soon. Okay, perfect. And then our last question we're going to have is uh, from Facebook. And it is, 
Is it true we have to wait 90 days after we recover from COVID to get the vaccine? No. So the 90, um, I think that's, uh, a lot of people know that um, after you get COVID, you're often told that you that doctors think the antibodies stick around for about 90 days. So it's true that you do have some kind of immunity um, after you get COVID, but we still want everyone who gets COVID um, to get vaccinated and to get vaccinated as soon as they are not, you know, not showing symptoms anymore. You're not going to expose the person who's going to be vaccinating you. But once you once you feel better and once you're you um, have a negative test. Um, go on and get your vaccine if you're eligible, because we know that the vaccine will give you immunity for you know at least seven, eight months. Again, the trials are still ongoing, whereas we only know that um, you have immunity after having COVID for 90 days. So go get your vaccine, even if you've had COVID recently. Perfect. Well, look, this was uh, fantastic information. Uh, people in the chat box and Facebook were saying that you gave, uh, you were delivered it in a clear way. So it was very informative. So we definitely appreciate it. Uh, and hopefully we can circle back around to you later on this summer when uh, we've got some more uh, vaccines out and COVID is situation is a little bit different to kind of discuss yeah. further. But thank you again for taking the time to join District 92 today this morning. Uh, and uh, we all appreciate it, Hattie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was great information, and we're going to make sure that we are going to keep you guys updated on what's going on with COVID. Uh, we're going to be rolling out our first edition of our district newsletter this week uh, on this Friday, so we're going to make sure that uh, anybody, we're going to be including COVID updates in that newsletter. Um, now, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about another issue that's very pressing in District 92, uh, our roads and our infrastructure down here. Uh, we are joined this morning by Justin Delancey. Uh, who is a government liaison with North Carolina Department of Transportation. Uh, and he'll be able to answer some questions about what's going on with uh, several situations. I have a feeling that several of you all will be, Justin and I have already had the opportunity to talk about Highway 160 and several things there. Uh, but I, 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 will, I will assume that several of you all have many questions for Justin. Um, and uh, with that, I will turn it over to Justin with a uh, DOT update. Good. Uh, yeah, we're still morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, you know, it's it's always a struggle to follow Hattie uh, when when we go around and do these things because she uh, she delivers such a great presentation in, in such a concise manner. Um, I, you know, I, I don't have a formal presentation for everyone today. Um, I just simply wanted to have a conversation with you about transportation in your community. Um, you know, one of the things uh, as a department that the, the sometimes people don't realize is just the scope and size of what we do. Um, you know, we're, we're a $5 billion agency on a, on a yearly basis. We've got 9,000 employees that work in every county across the state. Um, and uh, I've got Brett Knipe on, on the, he's listening into this as well. He's the division engineer for division 10, which covers Mecklenburg County. Um, you know, Brett won't like me uh, to say this, but the, the DOT is a lot more than just highways and a lot more than just building roads. Um, you know, we, we cover any type of transportation you can think of. We deal with Char Charlotte Douglas uh, in aviation. Um, we deal with, as Hattie said, local transit agencies uh, providing those last mile services to individuals to get in and around cities. Um, out in the eastern part of the state, we deal with the ferries. Uh, we do a substantial amount of work with the rail infrastructure. Um, Charlotte in and of itself has uh, an inland port uh, that's, that's supported by rail that works closely with uh, our ferry or the, um, <clears throat> sorry, our ports out at the coast uh, to deliver goods into the mainland and then distribute from Charlotte out to the rest of the state and the rest of the region. Um, so we're a very wide ranging agency and, and cover a lot of different things. Um, additionally, one of our uh, biggest subdivisions is the DMV. A lot of people uh, don't realize that the DMV uh, reports up through the Department of Transportation. So I know that there are likely uh, many of you, many of you watching on Facebook and, and many of you in, in the Zoom call um, that 
uh, have have been to the DMV and and have uh, waited in, in lines uh, like the rest of us to 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 get your DMV items taken care of. Um, you know, when we look at um, issues that typically occur in the district, obviously, uh, road construction and, and maintenance is, is at the forefront. Um, you guys are, are looking to do widening and extensions on 160. Um, you know, I wish we had had better news on that front and could tell you that uh, we were going to be turning soil very soon and, and we could get the project done uh, very quickly. But that project's been delayed a little bit. Um, you know, another area of, of typical concern in, in the region and across the state for that matter is uh, litter pickup and, and our, what our roadside environment looks like as you're traveling down the road. Um, you know, litter is, is something that we try very hard uh, across the state to keep, keep on top of, keep track of, make sure that the litter's picked up, make sure that the side of the road is, is mowed and, and everyone can see the, the lane markings and um, guardrails. Um, and that's something that we're continually working at. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions along those fronts. We've we've had some recent financial struggles at the department, uh, but we're coming out of those. You know, we, we've we've sort of changed tactics, um, made some some conservative reservations financially to take into account uh, changing weather weather patterns, uh, increased frequency of large storms that have hit our state. That have really cut into our bottom line recently. Um, you know, we're we're working on different ways to do things and different ways to to allocate our money um, so that we can better serve the citizens of the state. Um, I, I know that that's a very broad and, and general sort of overview of what we do, but I'm happy to answer any specific questions. And um, if I don't know the answer, I don't know that if Brett can speak with the way that this is set up, but we will certainly uh, take your questions back. Um, you know, I'm not an engineer, but I can get get the engineering schematics from the engineers and, and we can pass them on uh, through Representative Brown uh, to anyone on the call. We'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for that kind of overview. We do have a couple of questions that have already started coming in. So um, first, I know we already have one question about 160. Um, by the 2020, is 2024 still the anticipated start date for the expansions in Steel Creek? Um, I know the 160 has been a big pressing issue. I know that we talked about that, had the opportunity to talk about that earlier, uh, I guess last month um, about that project. But can you kind of give uh, everybody listening kind of an overview about where the 160 project stands? Um, you know, I, I voiced my frustrations uh, to you already about uh, the delay in this project because it seems like it's just never ending. You know, we keep getting a date, push back, push back, push back, push back. So can you kind of give a, uh, an update on where things stand on 160 right now? Yeah, so where we are right now, and and, and I, I know I, I want you to know that you're not the only one that's frustrated, and, and we hear that. Um, and, and part of what we're doing financially is trying to figure out ways where projects where we have delayed in the past, um, where we can find ways in, in certain circumstances to to maybe accelerate them back or to, to maybe find a way to, to push one section ahead of another where it makes sense. Um, Brett and I spoke about 160 in particular prior to this conversation. And, and you know, I think where we are right now with the department, what we're looking at financially um, for the first section of 160, realistically speaking, we're looking at 2027. Um, so I know that's not what people want to hear. Uh, it, it's certainly uh, not what the information that we want to send out, but but providing a realistic time frame with what we're dealing with the department and 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 where all the other projects that, that get prioritized along with 160 stand, uh, the realistic expectation and, and what we have on the books right now is 2027. That's 2027 start date. Yes, sir. That's start date. And that's for the, the section of I-485 to NC-49. So if we go with the 2020 start date, what would be the anticipated completion date? If we're, if everything goes, you know, 2027 is way off from what we've planned on. 
what we and what we talked about. I mean, you know, we've talked about that before. Uh, in the fact that they had, you know, DOT had the neighborhood meetings back in 2019, and we were looking at 2000. You know, looking at 2024 start date around that time, 2022 maybe. So, what would be the estimated completion date on 160 if that is if that is what actually ends up happening? Um, so I, I don't for that specific section. I I just I know that we have an estimated completion date, but I do not have that in front of me. And but I will I will get with Brett and, and his staff uh, after this and, and make sure we get that to you. Um, like I said, it it's simply I don't have that spreadsheet in front of me. Um, and and uh, but we can certainly get that back to you. All right. And I think Brett just actually raised his hand. I'm going to move him over as a panelist to see if okay, perfect. Can kind of give some. Uh, there we go. Brett, are you there to kind of get? Yes. Can you guys can you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay, I've I've been stuck uh, and unable to uh, uh, join with audio or video, and I think you might have just freed me up because uh, the the presentation stopped for a minute there for me, and I I fell offline. So uh, thank you for bringing me on board. I I was listening to the commentary that Justin was providing, and um, you know I I think the 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 takeaway here from the 160 project, I'll, I'll tell you, everyone uh, on on the meeting on the call, um, that that that's a uh, priority project uh, for Division 10. Um, that's by the way the the area of which uh, that, that I'm working in uh, um, here in Mecklenburg County, several other surrounding counties as well. But that project is a priority, um, and unfortunately, that project among among many many projects was pushed back uh, several years. Um, most of that was uh, due to the, the issues that Justin had pointed out, which, um, you know, uh, just dramatic cost increases um, in this industry in general, in the construction industry, um, and uh, the storm impacts and that, that imp those impacts to our bottom line um, were felt across the state. And so many, many projects were delayed. But um, one thing is for sure is that um, we're always going to be looking for opportunities to uh, move projects forward where we can. And uh, well, NC 160 in particular is a, an extremely important corridor. Um, it's, it's not just a regional route. It carries traffic um, um, up from uh, South Carolina. And we recognize that uh, that has a, uh, you know, a dramatic and uh, sizable impact on the local economy uh, in the Steel Creek area and uh, um, so we are going to continue to look for opportunities to move it forward. I, I'll kind of quickly answer the question about the duration and how long that takes to actually deliver it. You know, any project that is um, the size that we're talking about, I mean, just it, you're probably looking in the range of a three-year construction time, time frame. That's not fully established yet because the project isn't fully developed yet. We don't have full engineering plans um, that, that, and so those time estimates haven't yet uh, been completed, but it's certainly something that um, Representative Brown will be glad to continue the conversation on, um, and we'll be working uh, in any way we can to move it forward. It is definitely a priority project for us. Um, so yeah, so I guess the big question I have about that is, I know you mentioned the delays. I know COVID's impact a lot of things, obviously, um, delays with materials and things like that. I guess the frustration that I'm hearing from my district is this is not the first time that this project has been delayed. And it seems that, you know, I know that the, the state has an algorithm that determines, and CDOT has their al algorithm that determines the priority of projects. And, you know, we're hearing, you know, I'm seeing comments that are coming through on Facebook and in the Zoom chat, and we're, and we're seeing, you know, other projects be get, get completed um, across the state and other parts of the city, while this project in particular continues to get pushed back and now you know from you know just from from my own standpoint from seeing where that uh presentation was back in 2019 with a start anticipated start date now to you know we're looking at a full decade before this project is completed um and this is one of the fastest growing areas in the state so what is impacting um what's impacting you know how this project has gotten re reprioritized or what has changed in the algorithm to get this to take us? You know, I, I completely get a COVID, COVID, and 
supply chain shortages, all of that can 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 bump us back a year or two. But to go from you know three or four years, that seems pretty drastic to me from my standpoint. I think you're muted, Brett. I was, thank you. Um, I was trying to pull up um, a quick spreadsheet so I can just kind of put this in perspective and I don't have to screen share it, but um, you know, the, the cost here, um, I, I'll point this out, the magnitude of what we're dealing with. The current cost estimate that's shown in our state transportation improvement plan is just over $160 million for this project. And if you could envision, um, the hundreds of other projects across the state that are in that magnitude and in that scope that are in our plan to be completed. Um, if you were to just apply a simple, you know, a cost increase factor, um, it, it, it just it, it would grow exponentially. And so the reality of it is um, we, we have to operate in a fiscally constrained environment. Um, our funding levels are uh, fixed to what we have right now is what we have in front of us to work with. And so based on the budget that we've got, um, this project among, among many other projects uh, had to be delayed because the money was unavailable. And you're absolutely right, Representative Brown. There, there's a process and an algorithm in a way that projects are prioritized. So obviously some projects are gonna move forward ahead of other projects. And um, that's an exercise that we've been uh, working through over over the past year and a half as we've faced these financial con uh, conditions that have uh, required this pushback. Um, uh, you know, I, I do have hopes that um, our revenues are uh, could increase over time. Um, you know, I, I, I believe uh, firmly that, that the state um, needs a little more investment in its tra transportation infrastructure because we are uh, a growing area, particularly in the areas of Mecklenburg, Union County, many of our urban areas across the state. Uh, we, we are growing leaps and bounds. And so trying to keep up with our infrastructure improvements with that growth in population and the additional vehicles we see on the road, uh, it's certainly a challenge. Um, and, and as it stands today, the snapshot in time, uh, based on the funding that we project to receive, um, this is where the project fell out, and and I don't disagree that it's 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 uh, it's very undesirable. I mean, because I don't have the traffic data in front of me, but um, there are many many thousands of vehicles per day that use this corridor, um, and and those are real lives that are impacted that could be impacted, uh, that could be improved if we were able to find the funds and move this project up. I'll be glad to work with you, Representative Brown. Um, uh, Justin and I, we can have those conversations and look for opportunities, look for ways um, to reconsider this, reprioritize. But at the end of the day, you know, we are working with the, the budgets that we have in front of us um, and certainly willing to continue this conversation. Yeah, I, I definitely think we need to because, um, you know, I would like to see, and we can talk about this, and I, I would definitely like to see a list of projects that were slated around the same time as 160 initially and see where those projects are at in the pipeline um, and then make sure we can figure that out because when I, from my standpoint, I think about the traffic that this area has seen because you look between the past just decade, 50,000 new residents have moved into the Steel Creek area alone. And that's not counting the people that have moved across the border to South Carolina who use 160 to get uptown to go to work at the banks and go to work everywhere else. So. The, the economic impact, the, 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 the roads that are, that are impacted there, because there's clearly, you can tell if you've driven down that area, you can see there's a marked difference between the South Carolina side of 160 and the North Carolina side of 160. It's like night and day when you cross, up, cross the border. So when you think about the impact this area is being had and, and has had on the, on the region, I just think that you know, it's unacceptable that this project is getting pushed back this far and this many times. So I definitely would like to sit down with you guys and see what we can do to get that reprioritized, get that reprioritized um, regardless of, you know, I know I understand the algorithm, but at a certain point, you know, you can plug things into the computer, but the practicalities of it are, this is a fast growing area in the largest metropolitan area in the state. And it's one of the fastest growing areas in this city. So we have to, it's not sustainable. It's, 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 it's going to get to a point where it's just not sustainable. And we're gonna, it, the people who live in this district are being impacted every day by this. 
Um, so we're going to have to find something different to do to fix this. So I, I definitely would like to kind of sit down, look at these other projects that have been prioritized, think about what other what else we can do to fix that. God, I'll, I'll get to work uh, putting together that comparison list and you can you'll be able to see firsthand where projects were uh, in the schedule, where they are now, and you can see where that prior prioritization fell out. Be glad to work with you on that. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that we can work together and find a good solution. I agree with everything you're saying. This is a it's a vital corridor. I, I wanted to put one more plug in if I could really quick, because this could be a point where we need the community to help us when we do get to uh, closer to moving forward with this project. I wanted to point out something about this project. It's it's somewhat unique. Uh, it's somewhat different than what most folks uh, know about a road widening project. And um, what, what NCDOT has done over the past uh, several years in its project development is recognize that the future traffic volumes that we're designing for, that we're trying to accommodate with our plans, um, they're, they're creating the need for us to um, come up with innovative designs. Um, I tell folks that we can't continue to do the same thing without expecting the same results, and those, those same old results and what we've been faced with in many parts of the state in this area is congestion. And so there's some innovative designs. Uh, they don't always sit well with everyone. Um, there's, there's, uh, it's called a reduced, con reduced conflict intersection type design. Um, and so just if, if anyone listening um, and, and you Representative Brown, when it, when it comes time to get out there and get back to the public meetings, um, when we're trying to, to explain and deliver uh, this project uh, and why we've made the decisions about the designs we have, it's truly to accommodate the future traffic volumes. And so um, we, we do receive some pushback in that regard, but that's also something that I'd like to continue to remain engaged with this uh, district, this community about as we do move forward. Okay. And that's actually I, 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 uh, one more thing about 160. And I want to answer some other questions we've got about some other transportation related issues, but that's you kind of hit on it a little bit just there. Are the plans that you all are operating under the same plans that were initially presented, you know, five, six years ago? Because now we're thinking about how big this, you know, we're thinking about some of the project that was supposed to have start have started by now. If we're operating under those same plans, the projections of growth for this area are completely different than they were five, six years ago. And we're looking at yeah. another decade before it's completed. You're it's absolutely not right. slowing down on growth anytime soon. So are the plans that we still even have that were even presented in 2019, are those still even accurate for what the our anticipated need is going to be? So right now, the, the, the project, um, it, it was paused along with really almost every project that was in preliminary design uh, last year, okay? So we haven't began reworking those numbers, but if we keep the dates uh, in 2027 of going to construction, um, then we're gonna have to reconsider that. So we'll have to take another look at the traffic uh, projections and, and make those uh, tough decisions. But you're, that, that's a factor that we're gonna have to apply to uh, all of our projects that have seen a, a reasonable amount of delay because one thing that we're charged with doing uh, is is making sure we're designing for a future year. You know, this is a tremendous investment of public funds, and as stewards of those funds, we have to ensure that uh, that it's money well spent. So the project needs to have a uh, a reasonable life expectancy. So you're exactly right. We're going to have to take a look at that, um, and when we do restart that that work, it's going to be part of the conversation. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, let's definitely plan to talk to touch base this week about uh, getting some of those numbers, getting those project lists, and so we can sit down and talk about all of that. So um, I know Justin has my contact information and my assistant, so let's make sure we can kind of figure out where we can go from there, because you said you want community input. I guarantee you that when we start talking about 160, that it'll be, you know, a packed out Zoom call or a packed out room once we're able to get in person again. So I, I, I met a lot of folks. I met a lot of folks in your district over the years and our, our, pub, our public meetings, uh, honestly, were uh, this project with some of the best turnouts we've had um, I've ever seen on any project. So it, it's pretty impressive how this community gets involved. Okay. Um, I, we've got a couple other questions in the box and I wanna answer those questions um, before we move on to the rest of the thing. I don't wanna hold everybody too long today on this call, uh, but we're getting some good information out. Um, one question that we have is that uh, Grand Palisades is a private road 
and it was not built under DOT standards. Um, now it's become a major cut through for the North for South Carolina, North Carolina residents. Uh, builder doesn't seem to care about this issue. Is there anything that uh, that can be done on our side uh, to to remedy that? So um, Grand Palisades Parkway uh, has been a topic of conversation for um, actually many years um, in and around our area. Um, recently, um, I've personally been engaged with a few community advocates. Um, those folks are also talking with uh, City of Charlotte department officials. Uh, I've had conversations with the, uh, the builder that's currently responsible for that roadway. And there's no doubt that's a very tricky situation. The reality of it is, is that Grand Palisades Parkway is a heated recorded public right of way. It is not maintained by any public entity. And um, that's not terribly uncommon. Um, as developments occur, sometimes developers don't follow through with uh, pushing to get a street accepted to the state system. And in some cases like Grand Palisades Parkway, um, it, was, it was caught up in a, a situation where um, uh, the development standards that were applied to that roadway matched the city standards, not the state standards. Therefore, it wasn't going to be eligible for state acceptance. And um, the, what, what happened was, and we're getting into the weeds here, but I, I think it's worth, worth the conversation and in full transparency was that uh, when the uh, when legislation changed, I think in, I don't want to call out the date, I'll get it wrong. It was many, several years ago now. Um, involuntary annexation was no longer an option for cities across this state. And when that occurred, it limited the city's ability to annex an area and also impacted the infrastructure. The city could now not accept the street. The street stuck in limbo because it was not accepted by the state because it wasn't built to our standards. Um, we're continuing those conversations uh, with the, 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 the folks in that community. Um, and the city of Charlotte. So uh, definitely something I agree that we need to work on uh, as, as, as public uh, servants. I think it's our jobs to help find solutions to these problems. Um, and as it stands, that road is under the maintenance responsibility of a developer. And so, you know, uh, over time as things change, you know, there could be that, that we're able to move towards an annexation option, or um, I, I'm not sure what the react, what the, options are for us to put that in the state system. But as it stands today um, with our current uh, policies, it, it's not an option for us either. So, but we're able to, we're, we're continuing to work with that. Um, I discussed this with the executive management CDOT at Charlotte Department of Transportation probably once a month and uh, talk with the people out there in that community as well uh, several times a month. Okay, all right. Um, thank you. And let's add that to our topic of conversation too, but we can figure out some things on that. And I might reach out to the developer on, on that project as well. Okay. Um, another question that we have uh, is, does NCDOT own the planned expansion for Shopton Road West slash Youngblood, or is that a uh, county or city road? Well, I'm going to pull up my maps so I make sure I don't get this wrong. Uh, if you can bear with me here. So, Shopton Road West and Youngblood, this is down uh, far into the south. I'm not sure if I understand the question specifically, but I can tell you that Youngblood Road is a state road um, and it picks up at NC 49 and carries down through and towards the battle phase. Um, that, that is a state road. So if that's the question, yes. Okay, okay. Um, is there a planned expansion on that road for? Uh... Not, not, for not from NC DOT. Okay. Um, oftentimes folks see a lot of work that goes on on, on public roads. Um, if, if there's a development associated with that, many times it's the developers that are actually funding those, those uh, smaller improvements. Usually it's not a full out widening of a road or anything of that nature, but um, 
But no, the NCDOT does not currently have plans to improve uh, or widen Young Point Road. Okay. Um, we have one more question here that we've got. Uh, due to the delay in widening 160 from 49 to the South Carolina state line, so much commercial traffic is using Young Blood to Zor as a bypass, uh, despite the no through truck signage and restrictions. I've raised this last year to state police, but have seen little enforcement. Can we use the new ITC cameras at Youngblood and 49 to monitor for enforcement? I believe that is, um, that is a question uh, for enforcement, for law enforcement. That's outside the, the scope of what uh, we do at the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Um, you know, it, it, it it, it sounds, it reminds me uh, of the red light cameras that uh, the state uh, gave a whirl a couple of years ago. And I could say that uh, those aren't around right now. Um, so I'm not sure if that, uh, if, if, if that's something that can be considered. It's, I think, Justin, maybe between you and I, we can figure out who the right folks are to bring that up to. But um, outside the scope and, and, and responsibility area of what, we do as transportation officials. We're not on the enforcement side, but right. we know what the, we know where they are. We can talk to them. Okay. Um, yeah, we can we can figure that out. And Javier, I will also look to talk to law enforcement, and we can touch base about that as well. And I'll make sure everybody's updated on that as well. Um, <clears throat> one other project I want to get you guys uh, to get a brief update on just before uh, we move on, uh, if, unless there are any other questions, is uh, the roundabout that is supposed to propose roundabout on Berry Hill, Tuckasegee, um, off of Freedom Drive. Is there a update on that project? I know some local business owners were concerned about that, that impact to them as well. So that's on another spreadsheet. Uh, just pulled that up. And right now, just so you know exactly what that is, that is actually, um, those funds for that project do flow through NCDOT, but the project is being administered by the city of Charlotte. And so uh, they're called discretionary funds and they go through the local planning organization called uh, CRTPO. And according to my information, that project is scheduled to go to construction uh, later. Well, it was, it was, was scheduled to go to construction um, towards November of last year. But right now, it sounds like that they're just now scheduling their pre-construction conference with their contractor. That is a, a City of Charlotte project. We do have an oversight uh, responsibility. Um, it, they're definitely the ones administering the contract. But if there's specific questions about it, we can um, in touch the project manager to try to help us help answer those. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, I don't see any other questions in the chat box or any other uh, questions on Facebook. Um, so I think the big takeaway from today is that we're going to need to um, have another one of these conversations soon uh, after the, you know, I think after Justin and Brett, you and I are all able to sit down and discuss um, uh, discuss the, the situation with um, Highway 160, what we can do to move forward because, you know, the the frustration is is readily, you can see just from the, the what we've talked about today, frustration is there. And, you know, I'm frustrated with it. Um, the residents are frustrated with it. And it's the situation has been going on for a long time. We've got people who've lived in this area for, you know, several, several years that have been promised this Highway 160 project uh, to be widened. And, the need was strong a decade ago, and it's even stronger now. And to say we're going to have to wait another decade is just kind of unacceptable. Um, we do have one more question I just saw. I'm not sure whether uh, this will be actually be able to, uh, to, to do anything about this, but uh, one of the questions in our chat box here was, can Palisades residents add a toll? Um, I'll let you guys answer that question first. So um, that's an interesting question. Um, I had that question come up and I had uh, the question of whether or not it could be gated and turned into a private street um, just last week. And my response was, well, I don't know right offhand, uh, first of all. And second of all, 
because that road is not an NCDOT road, we don't have purview over what occurs on it. What I can tell you about it and my knowledge of uh, rights of ways in general is that it is truly a deeded recorded public right of way, meaning everyone has access to it. Okay. So um, I, I think that would be an issue that would have to uh, come through the county uh, because the Mecklenburg County is actually responsible for the closure of public rights of way. That would, we would have to involve those folks. Um, and but at the end of the day, I, I, I couldn't see that being a great solution. Um, just my perspective, but you know, there's, there's thousands of folks that live in that area. Uh, there's uh, thousands of folks that do travel on that road and you go know, use it as a cut through, some might say, but that's also considered roadway network and that's good for connectivity. Um, it spreads out the load, so to speak. Um, so it's good for transportation in general. So uh, whether or not you could close it or put a toll on it, um, interesting questions. Uh, I, you know, it, it, it could be um, the, the one-off solution that no one's thought about. I, I don't want to shoot it down. I'll just say that uh, it's probably worth uh, kicking around. I, I would say that, you know, some folks, you might get pushed back. Uh, some folks might say, well, hey, it's the, it's the way to get this road fixed up and brought up to a standard and put on a public system. So um, can't answer that directly today, but it's it's worth the conversation. We can we can keep that one going too. Okay. Um, we have one more question. This is the last question we have for DOT before we get into some legislative updates. Um, is there any update on the I-77 widening project? So I presume we're, we're talking about the I-77 widening project that's under construction now, or are we talking about the proposed widening of 77 south of the city, which is uh, south. Which, so <clears throat> that project is uh, another, uh, probably my personal top priority project because um, it does impact the most folks, right? And most folks are driving on that road out of all the roads in my division, that's got the most traffic uh, using it, you know, in the neighborhood of 150,000 cars a day uh, pre-COVID. So, but unfortunately, just like the NC-160 project, that project was pushed back. Um, that project is uh, um, a very expensive project. You know, we had a lot of preliminary work going on, uh, feasibility studies, traffic operational analysis, that type of work. And we got to a point where our estimates were uh, well over a billion dollars for that project. Um, and those were very preliminary and high level. And as we kept moving forward um, and thinking through it, you know, we're, we're probably looking at um, a billion and a half. It could be more. The reality of it is we, it's not a project that we're actively designing. So just like all those other projects I mentioned right now, we're, we're seeing a scope increase, um, a cost increase due to uh, many, many factors. Uh, right now, that project is showing up at the very end of our state transportation improvement plan towards the end of this decade. However, it is not funded. Uh, it doesn't have the money uh, in that year available to, to really even begin working on the project in earnest. Um, that's a project that I think we're going to continue to work with the city on, um, you know, seeking alternative solutions. Um, but as it stands, you know, if, if you take a, uh, say it's a $2 billion project, that's a pretty big chunk out of the $5 billion annual budget uh, that uh, Justin mentioned when he was speaking earlier. So it, I'm calling it a mammoth project, you know, uh, when I refer to it to folks, it's just, it's incredibly large, incredibly expensive, the right of way cost, the infrastructure cost. Um, we, we've got, uh, I think the concepts and ideas that could, uh, can make that project a reality, but based on what we have today and what we have in front of us, the funding is not there. So it comes full circle back to what I was saying earlier about NC-160. In order to deliver that project any faster, we'd have to have a ton more funding or uh, start thinking about alternative delivery methods. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, we're going to compile all this and make sure we can get all these updates in place so everybody can kind of see where these projects are going. And we want to make sure we're having this be a regular occurrence so we can know, you know, where these projects stand because they mean a lot of people in this area and this district. So, um, 
it's vital that we get these roads maintained and fixed and we get these projects widened. So uh, I appreciate you guys taking the time this Saturday morning to uh, meet with the people in the district of uh, here in Southwest Mecklenburg. And uh, we'll touch base this week and we'll start having our discussions that we, we've we alluded to on here. And we'll be able to give, hopefully we can start getting some, some better updates uh, with the, um, the next update that we do here, um, next community conversation. So. Brett, thanks for joining us. And Justin, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. Okay, Representative Brent. Thank you. All right. Um, with that, we are now, I know it's a little bit past the time we said we were going to be. We're a little bit off schedule, but uh, all these conversations were important, and I hope it was good information for everybody uh, that's been watching. I want to provide a quick legislative update on what's been going on in the General Assembly. So all of you all are aware, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Give me one second. All right. <clears throat> All right, now I um, want to kind of go over a few things with our office. Um, so everybody has contact information. You can find my contact information online uh, by going to the ncledge.gov uh, and um, you'll find all this contact information there. Um, you'll be able to see our address. My assistant, Ashley Lewindu, uh, she's also on this call today. She has uh, been very helpful for answering any constituent request. Uh, you can email both of us, you can call us. Uh, you can send us mail. You can, when COVID is over, we're, we're happy to welcome you into Raleigh and to stop by the office with any concerns you may have um, there. So please feel free to reach out, uh, take a screenshot of this information or go on the website and find all that information for our office there. Um, I wanted to talk with you briefly about the committees that I've been assigned to so you guys can kind of know what things I will be working on directly in the General Assembly. Um, first, I've been assigned to the Appropriations Committee, um, and specifically, I've been assigned to the Subcommittee on Agriculture, Natural, and Economic Resources. Um, Appropriations Committee is the committee that is designed to uh, set up all of our, our state budget and the funding appropriations that are going to be going on this year. Uh, we're getting ready to start working on the budget and all the different appropriations, uh, specifically with Appropriations, Natural, and Economic Resources, that goes towards exactly what it says, goes towards uh, helping fund uh, our state parks, helping fund all of our natural resources from beaches and things like that, uh, and making sure that our agriculture community is taken care of. So I'm on those uh, two committees. Also, uh, I'm lucky as an attorney to be named to the Judiciary Committee, where we will be dealing with several of our criminal justice reforms uh, legislation that will be coming up. Uh, we're going to be dealing with changes to our court systems, uh, dealing with anything that is dealing directly with the legal system at uh, the Judiciary Committee. So looking forward to working and providing some much needed change uh, as a member of that committee. Energy and public utilities thinking about how we're going to regulate our energy and our relationship that uh, exists uh, with Duke Energy and the regulation that needs to be, inform be enforced there. Uh, one of the things I would like to bring to the Public Utilities Committee is uh, expansion of broadband, thinking about how now it's 2021, broadband is certainly a public utility. It needs to be treated as such, it's a necessity. So thinking about how we can do that as a state and then regulatory reform. Uh, which deals with some of our environmental and some of our workers' regulations and our workers' rights uh, and things of that nature. So those are the five committees that I'll be serving on. Uh, but just because I'm on those committees doesn't mean that I won't be active with uh, all manners of legislation, all, all the different committees, and we'll be introducing bills that are uh, focused on several different committees as well. But those are the ones that I will be devoting the bulk of my time to that I've been assigned by uh, our House leadership. Uh, I want to talk about two bills that passed this week, the very first two bills that passed uh, the general, passed the House. Uh, the first is SB 36, HB 42, the COVID relief modification bill, which discusses several COVID relief um, of packages that was passed last year and modifies it slightly. So I want to make sure everybody knows you might have seen this bill in the news. This is a piece of legislation that is not necessarily new. It is modifying previous legislation that was passed to uh, help COVID relief. The governor has just uh, announced his proposal for a budget package for COVID relief. And we're gonna be addressing that, tackling that this upcoming week for a brand new package of COVID relief. But I wanted to touch on some of the things that uh, HB 42 
will address and change that will be of particular importance for people in District 92. So this vote passed uh, 117 to zero. So it was unanimous. Few people were absent that day. Um, so the first thing that is important for all of you all to take note of is that the extra credit grants that some of you might have heard for parents uh, to take advantage of that expired earlier in 2020, we've extended the deadline to apply for that grant until May 31st. So uh, every parent, as long as you uh, have a child that you were able to file for taxes for um, with your previous 2019 taxes, you are able to apply and receive a grant of $335. Um, you don't have to pay this money back, it can be used for whatever you wanna use it for. And as soon as Governor Cooper signs this legislation to law, I'll make sure that the link to go online and apply for that extra credit grant is available for everyone. Um, it also provided for $1.6 billion in educational funding that came from the federal government and the CARES package. And to talk about that, um, you see two numbers down there. Two sets of funding have come down from the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, the ESSER. So the first funding came from that first CARES Act, and it was uh, estimated, and it was uh, given to be $33.5 uh, million of funding to Mecklenburg County specifically. Um, we're anticipating the second round of funding that we will be receiving from those federal funds to Mecklenburg County by itself will be $135.2 uh, million. Uh, that's an estimate. We're still weighing our rough numbers. And the funding that each county receives is based on uh, the uh, Title I uh, status and Title I students and all those uh, metrics there. So that's the term is how that money is allocated per county um, across our state. So we've already received the 33.5 billion, uh, 33.5 million, excuse me. And we're estimating that we're gonna receive another $135 million there. <clears throat> and um, it also, that package covers $546 million in rental assistance and $95 million to help distribute the vaccine. So that's uh, HB 42. Um, HB 4 was also passed, which I had the uh, privilege of co-sponsoring, uh, and it is to extend the ABC permit renewal fee deferral period. Uh, it passed 116 to 1, and essentially it retroactively extends the deferral for ABC permits uh, to businesses who were not able to operate due to COVID. So uh, instead of having to face fines for not renewing your, your ABC license and things of that nature, it defers that period and you have until 90 days after uh, we're in the, I guess the quote unquote all clear when we're allowed to go back into full operation of your business uh, to get your permit and it will refund. You're able to get a refund on any permit fees that have already been paid for 2020 and 2021 if your business was not allowed to open and operate this year. So those are the first two bills that have passed the House. Uh, the COVID relief package has already passed the House and the Senate, and it will be going to Governor Cooper's desk, and we anticipate him signing it. And then the uh, HB4 will now be going to the Senate, and we expect the Senate to pass that and send that over to Governor Cooper as well. Uh, I wanted to highlight a few bills that I've had the opportunity to co-sponsor so far this session. Um, the first is HB5, which gives a $15 minimum pay uh, for non-certified employees, public school employees. So this will allow all of our non-certified employees at public schools in North Carolina, that's our cafeteria workers, that's our bus drivers, that's our teacher aides, all of them to receive a $15 minimum wage um, in order to keep doing their job. Uh, so that has not come up for vote yet. It's still in committee, uh, but we're looking forward to hoping that gets passed this year uh, soon. Uh, HB 8, which is to adopt the Equal Rights Amendment uh, to have North Carolina join the 36 other states across our country that have ratified the Equal Rights Amendment, saying that uh, no matter of your gender or sex, uh, your gender, you are able to have equal rights and protections underneath our Constitution. The uh, HB 33 which is to broaden applicable uh, domestic violence statutes. Uh, this uh, is a statute that has received bipartisan support to essentially allow the same protections for domestic violence protective orders to be applied to uh, those who are in same-sex dating couples. Um, 
next HB 41 to amend the lawful age to marry. Currently, uh, North Carolina is the state that has the lowest legal age to marry. You can get married at the age of 14 uh, with parent approval in North Carolina. It is the lowest uh, tied with, I believe, Alaska, uh, who is also that low um, to get married. Uh, 14 is just way too, I mean, even with parental consent. I, I don't believe that there's anybody who should be getting married at the age of 14. Um, and this law will amend the lawful age to marry and bump that up to um, 18 in North Carolina. And then we also have education change for military connected students. This will allow if your family is in the military and they're serving overseas and you're living with another relative that you're able to go to public school in the jurisdiction where, uh, where you were domiciled at. Um, so these are the bills I've co-sponsored. Uh, we've got several other pieces of legislation that I'm working on introducing um, to deal with food insecurity, uh, to deal with workforce development, to help our community colleges in order to make sure that uh, we're giving everybody the opportunity once they graduate high school to get a good job, learn a trade, learn a skill, um, and then also thinking about several other pieces of, of um, legislation that will be able to uh, bring new businesses and new growth to uh, the district, District 92 as well. So those are some of the things that we're going to be introducing in the next few weeks, and I'll make sure that all of you all are kept abreast of all of those uh, as we as we move forward with our legislation. And um, we're also going to be having a COVID new COVID relief bill. Uh, one of the things I'm working on this weekend is going to go be going through the government the governor's proposed COVID relief package and um, thinking about different things that will be. Uh, important for our district to get included in that budget. So if any of you all have any COVID relief items in particular, please share them with me um, so we can make sure that's included. I want to make sure that the voices of District 92 are really being felt um, throughout the General Assembly and included in all these big pieces of legislation and a big appropriation so we can make sure we're bringing some stuff back to our district, taking care of our small business owners, taking care of our everyday people who have been struggling and hurt by COVID-19. Um, and I'm always open. I've received several emails from constituents regarding new pieces of legislation, um, new policy ideas they have, uh, and also thinking about constituent requests. Um, my uh, legislative assistant, Ashley, has been working very diligently with several members of our district uh, to help out on constituent issues uh, ranging from unemployment. Uh, we've been very successful in getting several unemployment claims processed for members of District 92. Uh, we've had success working with the Department of Corrections um, for some of our constituents uh, and several other people. The DMV is another, uh, as uh, Britt and Justin alluded to on their call. So we're happy to help. If you ever run into any issue with a state agency, please let us know. Please reach out to my office and I'll put up our contact information again there. That's my email address and my uh, legislative assistance email address. Please reach out to us. Uh, we are happy to help and be that conduit for uh, whatever state agency that you're working through, whatever issues you might be running into, uh, we're happy to help kind of be that go-between and help you out. You know, when you think about the, your representative in Raleigh and what they're doing, a lot of times you think about it, it's just passing legislation. It's just going through passing bills, passing the budget and things of that nature. But a very important uh, piece of my job to me is making sure that I'm able to make your lives easier. So if we can help talk with any of our state agencies and even the federal agencies as well will help connect you with your, your federal representation. We're happy to do that. And it's a, it's a job that we both take a lot of pride in and we take it very seriously. So with that, I will open it up um, to um, any questions that you all may have uh, for me and um, we will be happy to answer them. So I see, let me see, I think there's one question in the chat box. All right, so this question is regarding um, credit refresh and can you give money? Uh, what about credit debt forgiveness on all medical bills, repossession, car debt, uh, forgiveness. Let me see if I can. All right. I have unmuted you, Miko, and you can ask your question.
Are you there? Okay. Um, okay, now can you uh, hear me? Yes, I can, yes. Okay, it, they said unmute. Okay, so the question, and the reason why I was asking about the credit refresh, we can give a lot of funds, you know, through the pipeline for, you know, COVID relief, but what about people that have lost you know, debt, you know, accumulated debt through this process, such as maybe their cars got repossessed. And then, you know, if a, car, a person's car get repossessed, you know, they still try to make uh, the debt, you're still responsible. Now, mind you, they didn't stole the car to somebody else. And, you know, y'all say the law is like nine tenths of the law is possession. So if they have possession of the property, you can't still hold me entitled to a debt for a vehicle that you're going to sell. So maybe like, um, debt forgiveness on that, all medical bills, because, you know, uh, people do have issues with Obamacare, not being able to meet the income requirements, but still have to get medical attention. And that's a lot of people's issues is medical bills. So maybe uh, considering that and maybe like a credit, you know, refresh, because um, you can get the debt, but if you've got a lot of stuff that, you know, through this pandemic, we're getting a lot of derogatory credit um, because it's a process and it's a little late when some of the damage is done. I think maybe doing this, I think everybody needs a credit refresh. I think, you know, some of this stuff, I know they're doing things with student loans, but you got to look at medical bills, um, other different uh, stuff. Yeah, no, that's a great Credit question. cards, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a great question. And I think one of the things we have to think about and work on, on on our end in the state is we've got two COVID relief packages that are coming down. We've got the state package and then we've got the federal package. And the federal package um, should address a lot of things that you're discussing, that you're talking about in terms of the medical forgiveness and things like that. And some of that stuff the state can't, the state can't address. So I think that what we're going to be doing um, on our side is we're going to be taking a look at what the, what the federal package is going to be providing for um, and thinking in terms of, um, you know, some allocations are going directly to the states. Some things are saying they're providing a certain number of amount of money that North Carolina is going to get X number of dollars from the federal government as part of the next round of coronavirus virus uh, relief packaging. And then Part of that will outline saying you can use this for X, Y, and Z purposes. Like, for example, right. when we saw the, uh, when we were talking about the COVID relief package that the state just passed, um, part of those school funds came directly from the federal government. And then we allocated them to our individual communities. So we're going to take a look at what the state, what the, what the federal government does. And I think some of those relief on terms of medical rec, on medical bills and credit are going to be addressed on the federal side. Uh, and we can't address those because those are through federal agencies. So we can't touch, you know, we can't touch credit and certain things um, to a certain extent. But then taking a look at where those gaps are and seeing to figure out how we can figure out how we can address those issues on the state side is definitely going to be a priority. So I'm happy to include that in my discussions that we're going to be having um, as we're talking with the governor and talking with the rest of the General Assembly on what we can do to give some relief uh, to the average person here who has been, you know, impacted, lost their job, can't make their payments on certain things, what type of creative ways we can do to provide some relief for that. Okay, um, so I know a lot of the stuff is on the federal, but don't, um, a lot of times they say like a lot of the credit bureaus, they're really not backed by the government. They're not, so, yeah. so I'm yeah, some of them, some of them aren't. Yeah, some of them aren't. And but they but it it gives us limited authority to, to do a lot on the the state side as well. But I'll reach right, out okay. to the DOC and um, kind of get some answers on that, and I'll circle back around with everybody on and circle back around with you, Miko, and and put that information out there as well. But that's a great question. Okay, okay well I appreciate that. Well, as long as you make it a conversation, I mean, it's in the room. Yeah, absolutely. No, definitely. That's the type of thing that I like to have. Make sure I can I can get as much information as possible and bring it back to y'all. So that's what I'm happy to do. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions about anything else going on? All right, well, uh, I will say this has been a very helpful session for me. I appreciate all of you all joining us that have been joining on Zoom, that have been joining on Facebook Live. Um, that have uh, asked questions. We, it was very informative uh, to, to kind of get the information from DHHS and also the information from DOT. Uh, it's also been 
excuse me, been helpful to hear kind of you guys' priorities as well that you all see uh, in terms of medical and transportation. Uh, again, uh, I want to stress, I said it when I was campaigning, and I said to many of you that I know that have talked to me and they're on these calls, I want to be available for all of you all. I want to be a resource, and I want to be an advocate for all of you all. So no matter what issue it has uh, that you have, uh, please bring it to me, bring it to my team. We're happy to help work with you on it. Um, you know, no matter what political party you uh, belong to, no matter what your viewpoints are on certain things, I represent all of District 92. And I take that with, with pride to represent everybody. And I wanna make sure that I'm listening to all viewpoints making sure I'm understanding where everybody is coming from and making sure that I can do the best to represent you all. And the only way I can do that is by listening and being uh, available. So uh, please uh, stay in contact. My contact information is still up on the screen. I'm happy to answer any questions, happy to talk to you on the phone. Um, you can find me on social media at Terry Brown CLT. That's at Terry Brown CLT on Instagram, Facebook, uh, and Twitter. So please reach out, please keep me uh, posted on things going on. I'm happy to come talk to any of your groups virtually. Uh, I've been setting appointments to talk to schools, uh, it's talking to other community groups. So I'm happy to make myself available for any of those um, opportunities that you may have. You would like me to bring any information in. And um, with that being said, I appreciate you guys' time and I'll let you get back to your Saturdays. And I'll keep you posted on this conversation with DOT and our next listening conversation in uh a few weeks. So thank you guys. Thank you for joining and uh, have a great weekend. Stay safe.